Um, so first disclaimer, this is mostly a repeat of a talk I gave at the Yao Data. So if you were there at my presentation, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> So I'll start with uh, something called the Peter Principle that I found out about. Uh, it's the fact that people in a hierarchy tend to rise to their level of incompetence. Um, so you're usually really good at something and they say, oh, because you're really good, we should promote you until you're out of your depth and you suck. Um, which uh, brings to me. <laughs> <laughs> So I started as a data scientist for a few years and then someone had the maybe bad idea to say, oh, he, he could lead the analytics team. Uh, so I've been doing that for a bit less than a year and still learning a lot. Uh, it's completely different. Um, and my presentation is about like the, from the day I started, I was just me and uh, a sales guy up to now that we're a bit more than 10 people and all the mistakes, all the stuff that we've learned. So um, don't, don't think I'm an expert, but I think I have some interesting stories to tell along the way. And uh, so if you don't know what Komatsu is, that's so the sort of stuff that we do. Uh, you've, you've seen Komatsu gear everywhere. You probably just never noticed that they had Komatsu written on it. Uh, so we make all sorts of uh, earth moving equipment. If it digs, if it trucks, if it carries, if it flattens, we probably make it. Um, if that cell doesn't ring a bell, you probably know Caterpillar and Caterpillar is sort of our main competitor. So we work in the Hunter Valley. Uh, every, every time people ask me, why the hell are you doing data analytics in the Hunter Valley? Uh, do you do analytics on wine? Uh, not really. Um, so this is because like, this is a, a map of the Hunter Valley and um, if you go on a, a wine tour, uh, they'll stay on the right hand side of that red line. Uh, what is on the left side, you see those little gray blobs and that is where a lot of earth gets moved. Uh, it's probably something a bit less known about the Hunter Valley and obviously the wine yells try to hide that part of the Hunter Valley uh, from the tourists. Um, so we do a, d a lot of data analytics on earth moving and more specifically uh, mining equipment. Uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot more money and uh, a lot more capital involved in mining compared to the little excavator of your landscaper. Uh, and so we are located near our customers. So you probably don't know too much about mining. Every time I come here, it's always about insurance, finance, um, uh, stuff like that. So uh, here are a couple things about mining. Uh, in the 2000, the US uh, ended the purposeful degradation of GPS. So before year 2000, GPS was accurate, I think up to 100 meters because they sort of jammed it. Uh, and then after that, they gave civilians a much better resolution. Um, Eight years later, Komatsu released a uh, level four autonomy driverless truck fleet. So uh, you'll see there, there's a LiDAR on this truck. There's some high precision uh, GPS antenna and there's no drivers on any of the trucks in there. And they're not radio control. If they lose their Wi-Fi or whatever they link, they just continue driving. They, they know how to avoid obstacles, how to stop. They can do everything. And actually, the, the fun fact about them, you'll notice all the, um, the tracks are very neat. And that's why you know it's GPS operated, because no human operator will uh, stick to the, the tracks <laughs> like that. To the point where the truck started to wear, like usually humans sort of spread it out. Uh, whereas there, they make the potholes exactly on the same spot, created new problems. Another interesting thing is that we've got a few uh, diggers which have um, LIDARs that are mounted at the top of the boom and the LIDAR scan the face that's being dug as the machine moves around and it's able to stitch a terrain map uh, live as you dig, uh, which on board the machine that's a sort of display that we show to the operator where um, I think green, green is on target, uh, blue means you need to dig more and red means you need to move dirt where it's red. So. It's pretty amazing. Someone loads a, a 3D map of where they want the dirt to go and the machine does all the calculation and tells you how far you are from complying with the map. 
So enough bragging about mining, but it's just to say we don't just move dirt, we do interesting things as well. Um, so the topic of this talk is a bit of background, so the sort of analytics we do in mining, uh, the beginning of our group and a sort of um, retrospective of the last five years, uh, our approach to R&D, picking projects, uh, managing stakeholders and what comes next. So uh, this is some uh, mining equipment at scale. So you, that's sort of the, the size of a person. That's like a big American F-150 pickup truck. That's a Boeing Dreamliner. And I tend to work on those little guys. I haven't really worked on the very big ones. Um, but yeah, even just that one, like you look at you for scale, they're pretty impressive to be around. And um, they, would, they would dug an Olympic swimming pool in two passes and a pass is 30 seconds. So obviously it would take you five months to move it where you want it. But once it'd be set up, you have an Olympic pool in one minute. Um, so the reason why my department exists is because there's a huge cost with downtime in mining and generally with industrial plants. So if you're talking, you know, a BHP steel, steel mill, uh, aluminum smelter, all of these things, downtime is very expensive. So you think I don't, the, the numbers aren't that accurate, but just think like um, per hour, it costs you $20,000 to have a digger and five or 10 trucks that service it, put the fuel, the operators. And as long as everything's ticking, you're making say $40,000 and now everything's okay. Uh, the problem is that when you have a breakdown and your chain is interrupted, suddenly you still have the same capital you need to pay interest on. You still have your workforce that you need to pay. Maybe the only thing you save is diesel. Uh, if they turn the engine off, but usually they'll leave the engine on with the machine idle because it leaves the aircon running. Um, so a typical thing like you could have on your primary digger, you could have a leaking air hose, something stupid. It takes one to two hours to fix. It's a $300 part, but because you've stood your whole chain down for two hours, you've lost $30,000. So that's sort of the, the environment that we operate in. So on those machines, we collect a lot of data, temperatures, uh, what's in the bucket. Uh, all the positions of all the sensors on the machine, where the joysticks are, what the operator is trying to do with them, motor currents, uh, pressures, brakes. And uh, so there's a total of 800 sensors on one of these shovels and some of them are sample at a 100 millisecond rate. So we do get a uh, fair few gigabytes of data per month. Uh, it's enough to do some pretty fun stuff. Um, so as I said, yeah, the machine will fault the control system will protect the machine from like severe destruction, uh, like fire or a complete breakdown. Uh, and we just try to operate below that. Uh, so we're trying to cut back on unplanned downtime. Um, so we use telemetry data to do this and we try to detect issues before they fold the machine and before they stop the chain. Uh, it's it's not so much about saving the parts. Usually when we detect signals of anomaly, the part is already broken. But as I said, downtime is expensive. So if we can save them time or if we can tell them, hey, this is going to break in six hours, you have six hours to sort an electrician, a mechanic and all these parts. That's already a lot of savings. OK, so a little bit of uh, history. So on my day one, I uh, was one engineer and there was a manager who was doing the sales. It was, a, it was pretty much in the big data craze where I jumped on the, the data scientist bandwagon. But it was also the midst of a mining downturn. So that was the share price of the business I used to work for. That got acquired by Komatsu. But I started here. We were a long way down from the, the good time and it was about to get um, a lot worse. Uh, uh, that was probably my first two years until eventually got back up and we got purchased by Komatsu. So six years prior to me getting on board, some visionary had set up all of these data loggers and all that infrastructure to collect that high resolution data, which was really good. Uh, everything was there and ready to work. It was this very old database. 
uh, fragile infrastructure and there was zero process. It was like, oh, here's some data in the database. So we hired a couple of summer interns from the uni just to boost the output. Um, the version control was to copy and paste in different folders. The <laughs> software developers are going to cringe. Um, but that was okay because it's just me and another intern, so we knew where we had copy and pasted stuff. Um, and we built a very rudimentary model factory, which was sort of doing data dredging. I, I heard now it's called OtoML, but yeah. Um, so there's very little hypothesis testing or all of this. It was just, hey, here's a lot of data. Let's do correlation. Let's try and model it and see what happens. Uh, it would usually be a bad, if not really stupid idea, but it works kind of well with machines because um, if stuff correlates really well, it's usually because they're attached together or they work together. So you can get away with machine um, and obviously expertise from your technicians. Uh, and then another thing that now when I recollect it makes me cringe is that we did something on your laptop and the next day it was in production. Um, but again, it was okay because at the time the mission critical wasn't to have everything running smoothly, but it was about demonstrating our value to the business. So as a lesson, like I think sometimes it's important not to get caught in the whole best process. If you're a small team and your business expects you to show value, uh, you cut corners and then you pay the price for it later. <laughs> um, yeah, there is sort of our... Uh, um, <laughs> our uh, mantra at the time. <laughs> so I've, I've been around a bit and talked to other, like our customers, the miners who buy our equipment. Um, actually started some big data science projects, so it was good to see how we did it and how they did it. Uh, we had a loose plan, very loose objectives and strategy. There was less capital invested in us, uh, lower expectations. And uh, really on my first day, it was like, here's a bunch of data, now do analytics. So I just did analytics, uh, which was like, okay, what's a safe bet? Um, and we went for this. So obviously there was very little input from the business. So we had a high risk of picking wrong projects, and we did. Uh, we were fast but disorganized, and as I hinted, we eventually ran into some problems. Um, one of our customers, which is like a, a tier one miner, had a really large investment in their data analytics. Uh, and the thing that surprised me, they're like, okay, in two years, you will have made us X million dollars. And they told that to their analytics team. They're like, okay, th they already knew how much they wanted out of them. Um, so to make that everything was very regimented, um, you had to do that many millions within the next two years. So there's a lot of preparation, a lot of think, and um, it seemed like it sort of cut a bit of creativity because there was no freedom to say, oh, here's a good idea, we could do this. Everything had to be business cased uh, and validated before they even got to start. So. Um, I think there's an optimum somewhere in there where you don't have no direction, but also you don't have too much direction. Um, so after a little while, we had a couple products. We had a few customers. So what, what's next? Um, it's the story of a startup that became bloated. So we had a lot of mechanical and electrical engineers, which did a lot of model, had a lot of ideas, but um, we had no documentation. Um, we had no real infrastructure code to interact with our database. Everyone just baked this into their own analytic. And one day our IT department said, oh, we're changing uh, databases. So we had to go back onto every analytic. And that's where I realized how, how much trouble we were in. Um, so that was also due to the lack of software engineering practice, which is sort of what happens where you put mechanical and electrical engineers to write analytics. Uh, and yeah, things started to slow down because we were maintaining code that was not really optimal. Um, and then because it's the routine, it's what you've done for the last three years, you sort of become blind to it. It's the way you've done it. It becomes really hard to see what's wrong without any external influence. Uh, you, you just like, oh, yeah, remember we could do analytics in two weeks and now it's a month. And then a year later, it was two months. It was just taking longer and longer to do the same thing. 
Uh, and then at the end we say, oh, well, maybe there's just us growing and things just going to take longer as we grow. Uh, fortunately, like two, three years after we started, we hired three team members, including a, a senior software developer who went on a crusade to say, you have to do this, you have to do all of those good things, and everyone's like, oh, rent, rent, rent. Um, <laughs> but, but eventually, we're, we're getting there, like we had to write documentation, we started doing unit testing, um, CI, CD, so like the, the much more uh, professional way to manage all of these analytics suite. Uh, so now we have two data scientists, uh, two engineers like mechanical and electrical. Uh, we have two software developers, one analyst, and then we have a three subject matter experts, which I really know the machine well. So one of our workflow challenge was, uh, I like this image because you were like, you were the data scientist, you were there, you'd make your analytic work on your laptop and you're about to release it. And it's about like jumping in this pool and if you, if you miss the pool, it hurts, it hurts, and it hurts. Uh, and more often than not, we'd miss the pool. Um, you would develop your model on the laptop and things would crash in production. Uh, so one of the things we're doing is now put your model straight in production, even if it does nothing, and then work from there instead of making this the last sort of cliffhanger. Uh, code reviews are really good. We get all five or six people and look at code, especially for like our core libraries. Um, and then yeah, automated testing, deployment pipeline, we're, we're making that separation between production and testing, finally. Um, so we work a lot with time series data. So it's telemetry. We'll get the pressure, currents, voltage coming as time series. So uh, uh, one of the difficulty we still have is that you'll do your R&D onto a block of data. So you'll download three months worth of data and run your analytics. Say it's a state detection or a, an anomaly detection. It works really well on three months worth of data. It's still a huge challenge to turn it into a batching process that executes every hour that seamlessly picks up where the last analytic run left it uh, that's able to catch up if it's fallen behind and the data was blocked somewhere in the network. Um, what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of nuances and things you need to think of when you're trying to make a robust production system compared to just having a static uh, data set on your laptop. Um, so yeah, standardization, I sort of touched on this, uh, at least all the core library, that's, uh, that's helped us a lot. So in terms of standardization, I figure there's like really three ways to standardize things. Uh, the first one is how you action the insights. So we're looking uh, on our machine, they're pretty rare failures. Uh, some of them are like uh, once in a century. So we do get high false positive because we're just detecting things that are very rare. So the uh, first thing is to streamline actioning the insights. Uh, can you quickly uh, determine what's a false positive? And so that's not your blocker. Once you've alleviated that, um, have streamlined tools for faster analytics development. So put a process in place, have templates. So uh, once you have a concept, you can put it into production faster. And the last one, which is for me the ultimate challenge, is streamline the analytics themselves, like having one having only a few off-the-shelf analytics where someone comes with a problem on their machine that they're trying to detect and you can just take it off the shelf, get a bit of information from them and release it in production without all the testing and all the, is it going to run, is it going to batch, is it going to fast forward, is it going to do this every single time. So a little bit on uh, our experiences with R&D. Uh, so this is a bit of a busy slide, but I, I came here a few, a few times uh, and every time I say, oh, this is always about finance, this is always about insurance, what am I going to learn coming from here? And it only took me a, a while before I realized we all use the same algorithms. Um, I talked to an insurance guy and he said, oh, we get all the features of this insurance claim and try to predict how much the insurance claim would be for to detect like false claims. And we do the same thing. We get the value of certain sensors and try to predict what the other sensors would be. And if it's too high or it's too low, then we probably have a problem in the machine, just like 
the insurer probably has a bogus claim. And again, it's the same with finance. They try and predict the price of the Caterpillar share given the Komatsu shares. Uh, and if it's higher or lower, they take action. We do the same. We predict a sensor value given another one. If it's higher or lower, we take action. So, yeah, I gained a lot from going to conferences and hearing from different sides of data analytics. But obviously, you guys are all here uh, listening to me. So I'm preaching the choir when I tell you to um, go out and listen to other people. Uh, we've had a lot of success with interns. I think that's noteworthy. Um, we're a pretty small team uh, and it's hard to do R&D where we have a, a large suite of analytic we need to monitor. So interns are really good because they can be, they can work autonomously, give them a lot of data and uh, an objective and say, okay, uh, do that over your three month summer internship. It's sort of cap price because that's whatever their hourly rate is for the summer. Uh, and then you just see how far they go. It produces a proof of concept. So that's how we got into TensorFlow. Our intern sort of did the proof of concept and then we were like, okay, there's something in there. We can commit a permanent employee time uh, to this. Um, you might be tempted to give them simple things on Excel and stuff like this, but I actually found it's the opposite if you get uh, People that are excited and passionate, the more outlandish the challenge, the more they engage and yeah, the more they work and they, they really enjoy it. Um, we work with the University of Newcastle, so we always try to get final year students that will do their final year project. So we start them over summer and try to get them to do their final year project for our, for our interest. So they sort of work for free for the rest of the year. Uh, and obviously they're under supervision from uh, an academic, so it's a really good way to inject some of the knowledge from researchers without having to go with like a formal research grant, which have a lot more capital and just are a lot more of a hassle. Uh, and then we get to hire uh, the outstanding ones so with a lot less risk. So a couple of projects, it's not gonna be very technical, but just for, uh, yeah, some of the analytics we do in this area. Um, so as I said before, I work for PNH, uh, and we got acquired by Komatsu recently. So it's interesting because they both manufacture very big yellow machines that dig dirt or move dirt. So when we got acquired by Komatsu, we were like, oh, we're just going to do exactly the same thing. Actually, it's quite the opposite. Uh, PNH was manufacturing more like the actual digging units that engage the ground. A mine will have between one and five of them. Uh, and they're like the top of the pyramid in terms of process. Whereas Komatsu sells dump trucks. So you usually have like 20 dump trucks that make a big loop to pick up the dirt that the digger is digging and move it somewhere else. Um, so it, from a business side of view, the types of analytics you would do are completely different. Uh, if you're working with like a prime unit, it's all about keeping them running because there is no redundancy, they must never stop. Uh, so it's a lot about full prediction and uptime maximization. Whereas if you're talking Komatsu and their trucks, a mine have 50 to 200 trucks plus spare units. Uh, at first like, oh, we can predict when your truck is gonna break down and people are like, well, no one cares. If it's broken, we just park it on the side of the road, dispatch another one. Um, so it was a lot more about um, reducing those cost of maintenance and a lot, a lot less specific, but make sure the machines weren't getting abused by the operators, that they were serviced on schedule, so the costs were low. So it was an interesting realization uh, that, yeah, again, two manufacturers of big yellow things, but like completely different objectives in sort of uh, data analytics. So if you were thinking, oh, all of this is easy, I can do it. Uh, here's my word of caution. There's the no free lunch of industrial analytics. Uh, can, can anyone spot what's wrong in that image? So there's a leak there, it's a, there's a crack in that air hose, so it's leaking air, it's a problem. Uh, but they're pretty weak, they're, well, they're a finite lifetime, I'm supposed to say. Um, so they crack every now and then, but the crews are used to 
uh, troubleshoot them. They have reels of that cable in stock so they can fix it. So that's why like from a data scientist point of view, it's a really good analytic because you have a lot of data. It's, you have um, a lot of cases you can work on, but from a business point of view, no one really cares. Like you're just telling the mine something that they can already do in an hour. It's not so, such a big impact. Um, I don't think I need to tell you what's wrong with this. Um, but just in case, you'll notice there's big cracks there. This is a gearbox. Uh, to put things in perspective, that big gear as, at the back is probably as tall as me with my hand, raising my hand. Um, yeah, they're manufactured to like sub-millimeter precision. So you can think it's a gigantic Swiss watch. Uh, that's worth several million dollars. So if you crack this, the gearbox is totaled. Um, but they're engineered for life, so they will fail once in a century. Uh, but when they fail, there are probably three million worth of parts and labor in fixing it, and probably two weeks of downtime. So imagine all the losses you've incurred for two weeks of that machine not working. So that's why I say it's a no free lunch, like whatever is easy is of low value, and whatever is really hard uh, is the stuff that's very hard. And then again, it might take three months before your analytic ever, three months or a year, and your boss say, why did you spend so much time doing that useless analytic for those things that never fail? And you're like, please fail, so yeah, <laughs> I can demonstrate my values. That's a um, strange uh, conundrum. Uh, so this is where we're using TensorFlow, where I was trying to say we're trying to get off-the-shelf models. Uh, these are like lubrication cycles, so the machine automatically oil and grease themselves. This is a healthy, healthy signal. This is a bit sick and this is almost dying. Uh, so LSTMs were really good into categorizing those signals and all the other flurries of time series we need to analyze. And that was one of the summer intern who ran that project and got this off the ground. Another one is that sort of data dredging algorithm I was talking about. So that machine would have 800 sensors and that's a very small subset, but it's fairly easy to see a lot of stuff correlates. So that's where we say, okay, well, if it correlates, uh, we'll just stick a linear model on it uh, and then make sure, check the residuals of those linear models and make sure that everything follows the model from day one. Um, and then, yeah, you have ensembles. Yeah, so you estimate the, the prediction, the inference versus what actually comes in. When I gave that presentation, my other data scientists say, hey, you're completely nuts. You're giving away our, our trade secret. Uh, well, this is kind of a common algorithm. And what I say is I, the, the secret is in the last line. Uh, <laughs> and that I'm not disclosing it. Uh, if, if you run everything without the last line, you have uh, astronomical false positive rates. Uh, but yeah, it's a good place to start. And then after that, you'll have all your technicians telling you what, what not, what not to do, when to run your model, when to tell it to shut up, and so on. Uh, stakeholder management, that's a bit of my uh, pain point at the moment. Uh, so this is a bit what happened when I started. So, right, okay, you, ha you have your PhD, you're full of good ideas now. I come here and you're gonna write business logic rules uh, to detect very simple failures. You know, if, then, else, set thresholds. This is, this is how we do it here. I was like, no, we can do statistics, we'll do normally detection. So there's a lot of effort like convincing people. I guess the, the mining industry is probably not as uh, advanced or not so much advanced, but probably a lot more uh, cautious uh, than other industries, I'd say. Um, and then the other thing is working with like the technical people, either the engineers or the people who fix the machines. So those people, like I call them subject geeks, because they're in love with their shovels, they know everything about their shovel, and I probably say they know it better than the guy who designed the shovel, because they actually built it and fix it. Um, so they know everything. And you have this sort of conversation. You as a data scientist say, oh, give me data about your failures. And they say, no, I don't have it. It's a rare failure. But let me tell you 
how my machine works and then you go on a wonderful discussion about um, uh, pilot valves, uh, uh, leak control relays and, and you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then you go, you go on this merry-go-round and say, can you not give me data? I say, no, but I can tell you a story. Is I don't understand your story, give me data. <laughs> and, uh, rinse and repeat, so I think we're gonna try and generate synthetic failure as a way to meet in the middle. So if you, can you at least like even just draw it on Excel what the trend would look like and then at least I can work on this? Um, yeah, because you have you have a fitter who's an expert in hydraulic system, which goes with a mathematician, and it's, it's not a, a marriage in heaven <laughs> by any means. Uh, it's also hard to explain the worth of machine learning. Uh, obviously for them, everything is simple, uh, like generalizing and the, uh, quality assurance. All of these things are not at the forefront of their mind, so you have to say, okay, you have to think a little bit bigger, and they tend to really make the problem a bit simpler than it is. Uh, and then you realize, that, oh, you can just do this with logic. Um, and then you, you either go and say, okay, it's not going to work, or you go along with it, and, and then what was 10 logic statement a month later is 200 logic statement because it was a bit more complicated than expected. Um, and then you say, okay, most machine learning algorithm are black box, so if it doesn't work, we can't just fix it. Um, so that's also a bit difficult. And then you tell, oh, I'll just need more training data and you get that sort of face. Because uh, obviously it is tedious and there's very few tools to label uh, time series data. If you know one, please let me know. Um, there's a why would I do unsupervised? I know everything and they do know a lot. Uh, they've seen a lot of possible failures, but at the end of the day, there's still 800 sensors. So if you can have anomaly detection, you've got nothing to lose. And that's sort of a hard message to explain that you can do supervised for the stuff they know, but you can also have unsupervised anomaly detection as an insurance policy if your machines start to do something weird that your technical experts have never seen. Uh, some interesting bits, again, with stakeholders dealing with the impact. Um, I, I once met a guy who was doing like uh, ranking operators based on which one was the quickest at operating the machine. And I told him, oh, what about your, conference inter your confidence intervals? And he's like, oh, my what? And I said, do you have enough data to make like sound comparisons? I said, oh, I don't know. Just if the bar is higher, then he's better. If the bar is lower, then... And so I explained to him what confidence interval was. And I think he said, oh, this is rubbish. <laughs> uh, it used to work and now you just made my life harder. You told me everything I used to think is now void. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Um, so, yeah. Um, the interesting one, your customer claims warranty on broken parts, but you have data showing that they overload the machine and they abuse it. So how do you navigate this? Obviously, if the customer doesn't like what you do with their data, they'll plug the Ethernet cable out of the machine and you lose all your data, so it's a, it's a tough one to navigate. Um, the on-site maintenance crew thinking that instead of helping them, you're out there to take your job. Um, and then, yeah, an interesting one is I, there are business models. I think they do it in the aviation industry. They rent it by the hour of the machine running. We do a bit of that. And then with the analytics, you identify patterns of idle time where the machine is running but doing nothing. Uh, you have to tell the customer, but the salesman who gets their commission based on the number of hours, they're not going to like you. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> some interesting remarks. Uh, so, yeah, close to the, nearing the end, what's next for us? Uh, we are trying to move into the human interaction space. Obviously, mining is getting more and more automated, but there's still a lot of operators there or a lot of human decisions. So now that we are getting the machine uh, reliability down pat, we're trying to say, how do we optimize the process to make things better? Uh, we're trying to do streaming analytics. So instead of batch and having all that uh, BS of having to resume an analytic when you stopped it, you can just listen to a messaging bus and when data comes in you process it your analytic never dies it's sort of sleeping when there's no data and wakes up when data comes so a lot less state management 
cloud versus edge, so we're trying to put a lot more of analytics straight on board the machine uh, because it gives us lower latency, at least for all of the simple logic checks. And we leave the statistical or the TensorFlow stuff probably more in our cloud. Uh, and then, yeah, a difficult thing we do is sharing those insights with the business. At the moment, we're just feeding back to a customer, but um, another thing to do is to try and feed back to the engineers who design those machines, to the parts people. Uh, you find that connecting all of those parts together is another challenge. Uh, so that's most of my talk, but before you run away, while I have your attention, uh, I was just going to say, if you think that a house with a block of land for half a million dollar is not a bad thing. That living near a one wind yard is good. And having Port Stevens Beach nearby, we are looking for software engineers uh, or data engineers. <laughs> uh, if, if I'm allowed to hire two, there'll be one senior and one junior. So if you know someone who's coming out of uni and really keen to launch their career into this, uh, yeah. I'm on LinkedIn or speak to me, um, but I say it's mostly software developer and data engineer, a bit less of uh, the analytics space. And finally, if you're around uh, the Hunter Valley, we have an event similar to this, which is the Hunter Data Analytics. So if you, ha if, you, if you want to do like me and drive to, or do the opposite of what I did and go to Newcastle <laughs> one evening, uh, and have something to present, uh, feel free, or if you're ever in the area, uh, come and um, see one of our talks. Uh, so that was my presentation. If you, if you have any questions, so I'll have some water before. Uh, evening, thanks for a good uh, talk there. Um, your data storage, um, what do you use? Do you go with structured or unstructured? Um, so we have an IT team that looks after our IT, so I can only give you a high level answer, but we have a dedicated time series database, so it's called OpenTSDB. I think there's another big competitor, but it runs on top of Hadoop or one of those uh, HDFS, and it is a database built to store a timestamp, a value, and the tag of what you're measuring. And it does only that, and it does it very well. Um, and then we have uh, alarm codes. So like the alarm will say, you know, I've experienced a shutdown for this, um, like the text data. And that uh, we store it into uh, unstructured data, I think. I, again, yeah, they're the, um, I think Impala, but yeah, I'm not. I don't, I don't do text so much, I do more of the time series database stuff. Hi. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, so I've been into the same industry and uh, it's a nice uh, you know, overview of what we're doing. So I have a question uh, uh, for, since you are interacting with sensors and uh, you know, you're getting data in voltages, uh, do you really face any challenge uh, you know, testing real-time data or doing a real-time simulation of uh, data? Because since you're, you have, you're receiving the data in terms of voltage, uh, it could be you know, uh, some inductance or resistance because sensors are different. Uh, do you really feel any challenge of uh, simulating real-time data? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So our, at best, like our latency from, from something happening on the machine and it making it to a time series database, it's generally five minutes. So it's not too bad. If it's five minutes, you can detect, you can detect things pretty quickly. Uh, but often that's not enough. So uh, one of the things we're talking at the moment is operator abuse. So it's not like us abusing the operator, but it's the operator <laughs> using the machine. <laughs> so doing things the machine is not intended to do. Uh, and you have to think that those machines work on very short cycles. So the time it would take you to dig something and dump it over a truck is about 30 seconds. So if someone did something wrong and it takes you five minutes for it to be processed on the cloud and if you can get it down, uh, like five or 10 minutes is 20 cycles ago. Imagine for t a 12 hour shift, you do the same thing every 30 seconds. If you tell him you did something 20 cycles ago, it's like an eternity away. So 
that's why we're trying to move on to edge uh, edge computing. Uh, I think we partner with, we're on Azure Cloud, so Microsoft. Azure has got an IoT suite uh, that we're trialing. So if something happens, it listens on like, I think a, a messaging bus straight from the machine. If something happens, uh, there's almost no latency and it connects through a protocol to the, the in-cabin display and tells the operator you've, you've done something bad. Thank you. Uh, um, you, you mentioned that uh, you mostly get your uh, your interns from the University of Newcastle. Now, I, I know that they have a pretty good uh, mining engineering department there. Uh, not as good as one from UNSW. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like, uh, of course. So pretty good. And um, I was just wondering, like, which do you find works best? An intern with mining engineering background who needs to learn a bit more about data science? or an intern who's done a data science degree and needs to learn more about like the subject matter, like the subject matter behind mining engineering. Uh, uh, um, we haven't had many. Uh, it the answer is both. So I've had like a pure math um, intern, and he was great for like a very high level R and D project. He did uh, research on autoencoders, very abstract. And just the quality of, like, he was my personal math tutor to a certain extent. He could explain things very well to me and help me a lot. Uh, but at the end, his project was, the outcome of his project was mainly a lot of knowledge injected in the whole team on those sorts of models. Uh, on the other hand, for the more applied project, I found that mechatronics engineers are really good. Because in mechatronics, you do a little bit of electrical and mechanical engineers, so they have good grounds to understand our machines. But they're also as close as it gets to a software developer without having the software developer only. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we, we go, mechatronics are a lot on our, our list. Uh, and they tend to be good with the math, be able to code it, and make things that are related to a real business problem. Um, but yeah, all are good. It's just what it, what really you want to get out of them. Thank you. Anyone? Thanks for the talk. Um, you mentioned uh, that Matsu and other uh, companies in this space have, uh, for a long time, they've been using largely autonomous. Um, uh, vehicles and other components, and your talk uh, sort of dealt mostly with analytics, where you're sort of doing an analysis. Uh, there's probably a person in the loop and sort of informing decisions. I was wondering if Komatsu is doing work in uh, sort of more, uh, sort of like continuous control problems or uh, sort of robotics uh, with a component of perception and reaction, uh, that kind of thing, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah, to be a short answer, the answer is yes, they do, but I'm not really involved in it. Uh, but yeah, the, um, they're, they're two big drivers in mining that uh, the operators are a very large cost. So the, the human in the machine and having them on a 24 hour fly and fly at roster is very expensive. So it makes a good business case for robotics and automation. And there's also the safety aspect of it. Uh, when bad things happen in mining, given the size of the thing, they're usually really bad. So if you can get humans as far away as possible from uh, the, the business end of the mine, it's really good. So uh, we have a lot of GPS guided uh, equipment. I know, so you sort of saw the, um, we have trucks that can guide themselves. We have the, that LiDAR technology, which allows us to say exactly what needs to be done. I think the, we're working on a system that still needs the human to dig, but once you've dug, you can hit a button and it automatically spots the truck and swings right over the dipper, the bucket of the truck. But it's still up to a human to actually do the digging part of it. And that's sort of the final, um, element of automation in that space. But that, yeah, that's all I know about. Thank you. And one last question. Thank you for the presentation. 
great presentation. Thank you. So uh, you mentioned that one of the challenges uh, is to really explain, you know, the, the kind of the model to the business and just sell it. And you also show us the, the demo of like you have a TensorFlow model you using LSTM. Yeah. So just wondering how do you actually sell like a LSTM a model based on LSTM to the business and like without challenges. Uh, the the selling part to the business was not too hard because uh, we have a lot of those models and coding them in logic. Although it seems simple, you're looking for something that goes up and then flat and then down. Given that there's noise and different difference from one mesh like across the fleet, it very quickly becomes very expensive if you're trying to do it with logic. So. LSTMs can generalize, they can make, you can solve the problem a lot quicker. Um, I think as the previous speaker said, our issue is still labeling uh, because all of those waves, the patterns that I showed you, uh, you need to find a very good range of them uh, and label all of the way things can go wrong. So it was a fairly easy sell to the business, but it was a lot harder sell to the technical experts, which we're going to do the labeling to the point where it's still our biggest problem with that technology. It's the really the only point where we'd consider stopping using it just because of the human expense in uh, labeling this data. So thank you, Antoine. Thank Give you. A round of applause. Thank you. Hi, I'm Greg Pearl from the Onsec Group. I head up the data science and analytic area there. Um, I hope you enjoyed tonight's presentation. Always fantastic uh, information uh, that we get from that. The Onsec Group are the premium technical recruiters across obviously data science, machine learning, NLP, artificial intelligence. I'm here to help organisations build their analytics team and their analytics function uh, with, with superior talent. There's lots of people out there, really good individuals across a range of different sectors that, are, that could be beneficial. And obviously I'm also here for the data science community to assist um, with understanding the market, understanding what jobs are out there, how to get into data science. So please feel free to reach out. So again, it's Greg Pearl at the Onset Group and I look forward to seeing you at the next meetup.